I want to thank everybody for staying after for the panel discussion. This is exciting after seeing such a great movie and presentation about Parkinson's disease. My name is Kim Gamble, and I am one of the program coordinators with Atrium Health, and I also serve on the Parkinson's Foundation Advisory Board for the Carolinas Chapter. So the first thing, we will introduce the rest of my esteemed panel here. The first person to my left is Miss Betty Chafin Rash, and I'll let you tell a few words about yourself and your connection to Parkinson's disease. I am, uh, or was a full-time caregiver of my husband, Dennis. Uh, it was kind of a shock. He was a very athletic man, a community leader. Uh, he was in tremendous denial about his condition, and I can say more about that later. But um, pure and simple, as, being, as a caregiver, it was one of the hardest experiences of my life. Definitely know. understandable. And beside Betty, we have Dr. Sanjay Iyer. He's a movement disorder specialist at Memory and Movement Charlotte. Thank you. It's great to be here and to see so many people I recognize and um, an honor to be here. Um, just seeing what Michael J. Fox has done uh, to raise awareness uh, is really inspiring. I think uh, I look forward to what everyone here on the panel has to say uh, about what we're doing and, and where we're going to go from here. But I think in general, I echo what Betty says, I mean, the, the, the journey she went through was tough. She did a great job and hopefully uh, we armed her well. Great. Thank you. And we have Anne-Marie Warman. She's the Executive Director of the Parkinson's Association of the Carolinas. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm so excited to see this group, and so so many of you, as Kim said, stayed afterwards. This is exciting. Um, I'm the executive director with Parkinson Association of the Carolinas. We are an independent nonprofit organization serving the Parkinson's communities across both Carolinas. We are headquartered here in Charlotte, though, um, so we we hope to be a resource to you, and I think we'll get into that a little bit more, how we can help the Parkinson's community, but I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. And holding down the tail, we have Phil Ritchie, who is the owner of the Rocksteady Boxing, the Huntersville location. And just a side note, Phil travels with his posse, if you had to figure that out. Rocksteady Boxing, you guys want to stand up? Yeah. Um, well, as these folks said, uh, just an honor to be here. Um, I received the opportunity to be called coach about six years ago um, and lead an amazing group of individuals um, all battling Parkinson's. Um, in that time, we've had about 156 boxers um, wow. uh, come through our program in Little Old Hunters of North Carolina, and uh, they just represent uh, what it means to fight back. And I just, like I said, get the opportunity to be called coach and uh, to help me out with that. So looking forward to the panel and discussion this evening. Great. So I think we'll start with Dr. Iyer. I think the movie did a great job of defining Parkinson's, talking about symptoms. But just let Dr. Iyer just give us a brief recap of what is Parkinson's disease. Well, we have a very educated audience here, so uh, I won't belabor the point. But um, Parkinson's disease is a condition in which the, the brain cells that make a chemical called dopamine start to die off. Um, dopamine is what helps the brain talk to your body to facilitate movement. Uh, the analogy that I would use, I learned from my daughter when she was in sixth grade and I was showing her some videos of some patients and her reaction was, Dad, that guy's moving like the Tin Man. <laughs> so she had just seen the Wizard of Oz and so she saw the Tin Man who couldn't move and it was the oil can that got him moving. Well, dopamine is the oil can. So uh, more dopamine helps people move more fluidly, um, more uh, smoothly, uh, quicker, maybe reduce tremors. Uh, and too much dopamine helps people move too much, like when Michael J. Fox is squirming around with the, the dyskinesia as we know it. Um, but you know, Parkinson's is the second most common 
neurodegenerative disease only to Alzheimer's. About a million and a half people in the U.S. currently have it. Um, it causes uh, trouble with tremors, uh, slowness of movement, stiffness of movement, some trouble with walking, maybe some balance, and a lot of invisible symptoms that might be even more disabling, like constipation, uh, changes in mood like depression, anxiety, big uh, blood pressure fluctuations that cause dizziness and a lot of other things like that. But um, I think it's, it's manageable uh, with the right treatments. Um, and um, that's what I would say Parkinson's is. Thank you. So with that, are there any questions on the floor at this time? Okay. Yeah, I have one. Yes. Um, as a family member, what can I do to be supportive? I feel like sometimes I'm being over the top, <laughs> if that makes sense. So the question is, as a family member, what can she do to be supportive that she feels like sometimes she is over the top? And you think you can handle that one? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a hard one. Um, well, what can, I think you need to answer that question. Well, I was gonna say, I'm gonna slide it down. I'm gonna let Anne yeah. Marie, then she is the resource guru exactly. on the panel. Let's, let's start with her. I think a lot of it is just communication with the person with Parkinson's. You know, ask them, what do you want from me? What do you need from me to support you? So that then you don't feel like you're being over the top and maybe they don't feel like you're coming on too strong. So I always tell people just open that line of communication and ask, what can I do? What can I give you? How can I help? And then once they tell you those things, then you can come back to us and we can say, here's a great way for you to do that. Here's another way that you can handle that. Um, but that's what I always try to tell people is just communicate and, and really ask them. And if they won't tell you, then maybe there's another person in their life that's close to them too and you can say, hey, this is what I want, I, I want to do. Help me, you know, figure that out. I want to be supportive. Thank you. Well, that's good. No. Do you have anything to add to it? You still want me to No, I'm asking a question. I was going to say, the only other thing that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just had a question probably for Dr. Iyer. I was saying, um, when they have one, when you see one case of Parkinson's, you see one case of Parkinson's. And I felt like the movie kind of gave the impression that all of Parkinson's follows kind of the same course, and they made it sound like it's a death sentence that you're, that you're not getting out of this one, I think they said. And uh, I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. You want to repeat the question okay, before you go into it? I think the, the question was around, well, if you've seen one patient with Parkinson's, you've seen one patient with Parkinson's. I think that really speaks to the fact that everybody is so different. You know, no, no two of my patients, no two of any of your patients are the same. Uh, it's important to recognize that. It's important to realize that everyone's symptoms are different. Everyone's progression may be different. Um, the challenges people face are different. Um, at the same rate though, uh, there is some commonality in what some of the challenges can be. And I think learning from each other uh, is very important. Um, you know, I saw a patient the other day, she's very new to the diagnosis and she went to one of the exercise classes uh, and she came back feeling very discouraged. Um, she saw a lot of people who had very advanced Parkinson's, but that may never be what she becomes. So it's important to realize that but at the same rate, you know, what can we learn from each other? Um, I think getting back to the point that you had made about you know, family members, what can family members do? Uh, one thing we encourage is um, go to the doctor's appointments with your loved one. Uh, you bring a different perspective, you bring a different lens, um, you can bring different ideas. You know, you know, men especially, we're great at minimizing our symptoms. Uh, we, we walk into the office and say, oh yeah, I'm doing great. <laughs> and then uh, the loved one or the spouse or the, the family member says, well, what do you mean by great? Is it that you can't walk for half a day? Is it because your medicines quit working? Is it because of this? So I think bringing that perspective and, and bringing to more data to the, the doctors is very helpful. That, that would be a very helpful thing you could do. So I'd like to bring Phil in at this point. Being part of Rocksteady Boxing, you see a lot of different levels and you see a lot of different Parkinson's patients at different stages. 
what would you offer up to a patient, say one that comes in to say that I'm not a boxer, and then just kind of talk about the different levels that you have? Uh, usually when I get that, my first, my, my first response to that is I'm not a boxer either. So the cat's out of the bag. I'm the head boxing coach. I don't have much of a boxing background, so a lot of us is just figuring this out together. And, um, you know, I think our energy is very much of just once you see our team working out, you know, there are a bunch of different levels, but everyone is just so kind. And um, we had a, a couple come visit us today, and every single person went up, introduced themselves, spoke a little bit about their personal experience. Um, and I think it's just recognizing that, you know, while everyone's different, you know, we have 37 people in that gym today boxing, and everyone's fighting the same thing. Everybody's fighting the same fight. And, um, you know, back to being a family member, I've seen some of the most beautiful relationships, you know, from our caregivers, from husbands, from wives that are boxing alongside or, you know, waiting out in the hallway and the first one to give their boxer a hug when they get done with class or, you know, those grandkids that come and, and watch grandma be a boxer and fight. And, you know, when we think about Muhammad Ali or, you know, a boxer, there's a, there's a thought to that, but we're a different type of boxer and, and we're fighting Parkinson's and we're fighting it together. We're fighting it as a community and we're knowledge sharing and um, really just trying to use that team as much as we can to, to build that community and be there for each other. Um, and so while I wouldn't look at it as a, a support group, it's definitely a team of folks that are absolutely there for you. Uh, just some beautiful friendships that have been made. Um, and so, yes, I wouldn't call maybe any of us a boxer in a ring, you know, but uh, man, we're, we're boxing in this thing called life and we're boxing to knock out Parkinson's and I think that's our definition of boxer. So Phil, I'm going to stay there for one more second. Can you explain to them kind of the rock steady boxing concept that it's not just exercise, but how you stimulate and the other parts that go along with that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, our class is about an hour long. Um, I tell everybody, I mean, we had the former mayor of Huntersville come. I, I, know, I know he wouldn't mind me sharing this. He said he was sore for a week. So, I mean, we, while we have some folks that, you know, maybe bound to that walker, or bound to that wheelchair, and we have modifications for them, uh, there's plenty of folks back there that could probably run a mile faster than I could. And, you know, it's just a matter of finding where you're at for that day, um, getting that workout in. And so we start with a, a general warm up, just like anyone in here would before they do a workout. Um, and uh, really focusing on range of motion, focusing on our base, focusing on our confidence, our stability, um, and just getting the heart rate going, getting those endorphins going, getting that body feeling good. And then we'll do a lot of mitt work, a lot of heavy bag work. I always say, if I was training a boxer, I'd train them just like we train our rock steady boxing team. You know, intensity might be different sometimes, duration might be different sometimes, but the workout is the workout. And we do an absolute very strong boxing workout, whether someone needs to be sitting down that day or whether somebody's moving all around that bag and they're running with Coach Fred or, or whatever that may be. So, um, and then we'll finish with um, some movement exercises. So big steps to little steps or big hands to little hands and really just trying to get the mind and the body working together taking our time with it like the gentleman that was working with michael j fox you know hey take a moment to settle in and we'll pick it right back up where that is um and so really just trying to focus on movement focus on energy um and then my, my favorite part of class we'll do a, a breakdown where we stretch it out at the end and we clap it up and scream and hoot and holler like it's remember the titans and bring it in for a rock steady on three and you know tell everybody we love we love them and we're proud of them and so just trying to have that that energy that's going to touch the mind the body the soul <coughs> and all those things that are important, once again, just for all of us. Great. Other questions in the audience at this point? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was going to ask you, so if someone um, just early, is it like if getting involved with physical activities, is it better to start as soon as you find out about it, or does it um, really make a difference if somebody, you know, is in denial with the way we are? I don't know how to explain it. So the question is, is it better to start exercise early on? I think it's the best way to kind of put it. And be steady with it. And be steady and continue the exercise. So Dr. Iyer, that feels like a question for you, the impact of exercise in Parkinson's disease. I would say yes, yes, and yes. Um, the earlier you start, the better, and the more you stick with it, the better. I think we noticed during the pandemic um, what happened. Well, yeah. the exercise classes closed. Uh, we weren't getting out. People weren't communicating and, and socializing, and, and we all, you know, felt it. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't gain it back uh, when you get back into it. I think people realize when they exercise more, they feel better. When they feel better, they want to exercise more. 
Uh, and, and my patients will tell me when they go on vacation and they miss their rock steady boxing class, they come back and say, gosh, you know, I feel like I've taken a step back. I need to get back to my boxing class. And I think that's a testament to what it can do. And I think, you know, besides the movement, uh, I think, you know, Phil hit on something that the movement is really in, important. At the same rate, they work on memory, they work on your voice, they work on your balance, they work on so many things. And ultimately, it's the fellowship that comes out of it that motivates people to really want to continue doing it. Um, the accountability that comes, so you can't underscore the importance of that. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. I, I have a question for Dr. Iyer about the Memory and Movement Charlotte Center. Oh yeah. What else is it connected to? So what else is Parkinson's connected to that would make you name it Memory and Movement versus Parkinson's Charlotte Center? Our founding partner um, was very interested in, in dementia or, or memory care as his parents were touched by that. So it was originally known as the Memory Center Charlotte. Um, we started sharing patients over the years uh, and ultimately when I joined, we decided to change the name to Memory and Movement because that brought the movement side of it. I think there's a lot of overlap. A lot of the, the movement patients with Parkinson's, uh, um, some may develop issues with their cognition, so there's overlap. A lot of the patients with dementia uh, or Alzheimer's or Lewy body disease might develop some movement issues, so there's a lot of overlap there, and that's kind of where the name came from, but that's why. Thank you. When was it established? Because it, it didn't exist, you know, when Dennis was diagnosed, and I, I only wish it had. It's been, what, 10 years? Almost no, 10 years. 2013. 2013, thank you. Okay. So it was in existence. <laughs> Oh, so along that, I was going to say, let's talk a little bit about your story. What do you... Well, my story, as Dr. I really <laughs> knows, is in some ways quite different. Um, you know, when I watched and thought about Michael J. Fox going through Parkinson's for, what, three decades? When my husband, Dennis, was diagnosed, um, no, no question, he had had it. And he, as I said, he was in denial, you know he was stooping, and I would say, honey, why are you stooping? Every man in my family always stooped. Uh, it became clear to me with the shuffling, you know, with the slowness of movement, with the difficulty of, of, of buckling a belt, buttoning his shirt. And so <laughs> I was with a friend, a good friend, and I described what was going on, and she said, Betty, he has Parkinson's. Parkinson's and so sure enough he, she had family members with Parkinson's so I went home obviously like most of us googled Parkinson's realized that Dennis had seven of the ten symptoms so uh, we were at our lake house and I said to Dennis we, we need to have a conversation a serious conversation he said about what I said you <laughs> I think you have Parkinson's, of course, totally shock on his face. Um, and when his principal care physician recommended that he go see a neurologist, she said, yes, I think you have Parkinson's. And I will make a, I'll give you a prescription. And tomorrow I'm going on maternity leave. <laughs> so three months later, we went back to see her. It was clear that she didn't know very much about Parkinson's. Luckily, through some mutual friends, we found this doctor who does know, obviously, a lot about Parkinson's. But unlike Michael J. Fox, unlike a number of people with Parkinson's, Dennis deteriorated very quickly. Uh, he was diagnosed and within a little over two years, he died. Uh, and I don't, <laughs> So it's difficult, me, difficult for me in a way to relate to what I just saw with Michael J. Fox. It was a beautiful story. Uh, you know, I could empathize with his frustration about what was going with his body, and I watched what happened to Dennis. Um, even now, it's, it's very painful for me, and you know this, to understand how he deteriorated so quickly. Do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> oh no, he's told me before, I don't really understand. 
I mean, as we said, every course is so different and everyone that's right. involved is so different and right. um, the factors in their care are, are so different, but um, he certainly was a very special man. And uh, as much as, uh, as, as Betty would, would say, you know, he's having these challenges and he's having this, he would always come in with a smile on his face oh, and no, say, you know no, what, no. I'm doing just fine. No, never got depressed. He would just say, I have Parkinson's, it's inconvenient. <laughs> yeah. I was say, Betty, do you have a, something that you would share with like a caregiver or a family member, something to motivate them or kind of share with them as a motivator? Well, the most important thing I think is as a caregiver is to tell the person for whom you're caring how much you love him or her. Uh, I think that that means so much. and. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times knowing what I was giving up to take care of him on a, almost a full-time basis, the number of times he would look at me and say, I, was, I love you so much. That's great so that you still really, have It's great really time. important. Yeah. I mean, the communication, I think, between the caregiver and the patient is, is so important. It really is. So it sounds like kind of focusing on those good moments that you Absolutely. had with him is definitely what got you Absolutely. through and hold on to those memories right. that it wasn't a death sentence even though it is a chronic disease. No. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your story. And Marie, let's talk about some of the resources here that you, the Parkinson's Association of the Carolinas have to support North and South Carolina programs and resources. Sure, we're, um, that's what we wanna do. We wanna be that um, resource to you to connect you to services, whether it is a movement disorder specialist or exercise movement therapy classes like rock steady yoga. So we, we offer um, free classes ourselves in upper state South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, Charlotte, um, Mooresville, Southport, North Carolina. We have yoga, dance for Parkinson's and pedaling for Parkinson's. Um, it's important to us to um, offer things for free because we, we feel you all have enough of a burden financially with treatments and medications and as long as we can, we're going to do that. So we have uh, support groups, we list all of the movement exercise opportunities across both states. So if you call us from Anderson, South Carolina, we're gonna check and we're gonna say, yeah, guess what? There's a power moves class in your area. Here's where it takes place. Um, we also offer educational programs throughout the year. We have several coming up, um, May 31st with Dr. Iyer, an educational program. On June 8th, another educational program with Dr. Wiggins um, and I believe Dr. Fleming, I'm not sure. Um, so we have that one and then we have a new class starting on June 24th. It's a newly diagnosed Parkinson's program for people diagnosed in the last three years. You're gonna go through a half day on a Saturday and you're gonna have a movement disorder specialist and possibly some other experts kind of just walk you through Parkinson's disease from beginning through all the various stages and things that are associated with it. We'll be advertising that through our emails. We offer um, virtual programming. We have a virtual support group every month because we learned that from the pandemic and we said, novel idea, let's keep doing that for people who can't get to an in-person support group or don't have one near them. Uh, we also have a Wellness Wednesday virtual program every month. We try to bring you speakers on wellness. It might be just, you know, how to, how to alleviate caregiver burnout, how to declutter your home, something just to take your mind off and, and just practice some physical, emotional, um, mental rejuvenation. So we try to be that resource for you. Um, we have peer-to-peer -peer resources. We just talked about this the other day that if you're not ready for a support group, because as we've mentioned, a lot of people when they're first diagnosed don't wanna go into a situation and see somebody further along in the progression of the disease, I, I, I can't do that. We offer one-to-one peer-to-peer support. You can contact us and we will match you up with one of our volunteers who has Parkinson's or is a caregiver, and you can connect with them on an individual basis. We've had some come up with, you know, partnerships that couples 
met couples and, and now they're friends five, six, seven years later, playing cards on Friday nights. So it's a great opportunity. We have lots to offer for you. We're happy to do the Googling for you so that you don't get frustrated trying to find things. That's what we want to do. We want to do the finding for you and then connect you and get you there. Um, and so that's kind of part of what we do. And if you want to know more, we have brochures in the lobby. Feel free to take one, call us. And we had a lady today leave a voice message. She goes, I just want to talk to someone. I don't know if that's what you do, but I need to. And we're going to call her tomorrow. And I'm going to listen to what she has to say. Because sometimes it's just talking to someone and bouncing what you're going through off them to learn something new that we can ha hopefully help her with. Um, so th that's, we're here. We're here to be your resource, to connect you, your family, your friends, help you with navigating work if you're still working, uh, all of those things. Great. And us in the Carolinas, we are fortunate that we also have support from the national organization, the Parkinson's Foundation. They have a very similar goal as in Anne-Marie and the local here that they offer resources and free educational symposiums as well. So we are very blessed here in the Carolinas to have two organizations to support the Parkinson's community. Other questions in the audience? One thing I would comment is that uh, people always ask, well, where should I go and read? What should I look up? Where should I go? And you know, we tell folks, well, don't, don't let this consume you. Um, it's good to stay on top of what's happening, but um, this is just one part of you. But if you're interested in learning more, the Obviously, the Michael J. Fox uh, you know, Foundation has uh, amazing information. Uh, his scientific team is uh, you know, second to none. Uh, and also the Parkinson's Foundation, which is very uh, well represented here today. Those are the two organizations that I, I usually will refer my patients to, um, to read about and learn about Parkinson's. So that leads you to my next question. Yes, sir. Sorry, quick question. Betty talked about Dennis saying, he wants to know if Parkinson's is hereditary disease. Dr. Iyer? Probably, the literature will say probably five to 10% of cases may be familial. Um, there are a number of genes that have been identified that can run in the family um, at the same rate. Uh, there are a lot of families that have the gene but don't have the disease. It's, it's pretty complicated, so I think likely an interplay of environment plus genetics uh, kind of plays into it, but roughly five to 10% is kind of what the literature shows. I was gonna say, and Michael J. Fox, as well as the Parkinson's Foundation, actually have some genetic testing for patients that are diagnosed with Parkinson's at this point. So that's another resource for additional information about genetics. I have a question about that too because I get asked a lot, Dr. Iyer. Um, if someone has been identified who has Parkinson's with the Parkinson's gene, would it be beneficial for their children to be tested for that gene? Would you recommend that they follow that path? And it's always a loaded question because yeah. um, you know if you have the gene, uh, it doesn't always mean you're going to have the disease. Um, but second, um, you know if you know you know, 30 or 40 years ahead of time that you're gonna have something and if there's not a cure for it or something that will slow the progression, do you want to know? So it is a bit of a loaded question. I think right now uh, we have a lot of patients who will call and ask and say, well, my dad's got Parkinson's, I wanna be tested, um, should I be? You know, I think um, by and large, I would tell them no. Okay. Let's go to the back there, gentleman in the blue shirt. I'll come back to you ladies here. Anything on the horizon as far as pharmaceuticals that uh, are making some uh, noise in the industry? Is that anything on the horizon as far as pharmaceuticals? Yeah. I think in terms of the pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, that I'm the most excited about that uh, are on the horizon might be uh, some of the, the subcutaneous infusion pumps, uh, much like the uh, insulin pumps that they have for diabetics. Uh, there are a couple of pumps, one uh, with levodopa, uh, or that many patients with, with uh, Parkinson's are currently taking orally. Uh, there's another one with apomorphine that's being looked at. 
I think those are uh, going to be game changers at some point when they come out. Again, not sure when, hopefully within the next year or so, but we'll see. Um, those would be the two most promising pharmaceutical agents that I'm excited about. Okay. Young lady here in this row with the barrette, you had your hand up? Oh, that was my, my question. Okay. It's showing him taking the medication real often when he had a situation where he needed to be more calm down. How much is that going to help him when he gets out of So the medicine he was popping is the, the carbidopa, levodopa, or the cinnamet um, that many people take. Um, most people can tell when they take it, uh, when it kicks in and how long it lasts and when it wears off and they start to dose themselves accordingly. Um, you know, I would say average is about four hours, five hours maybe is how long it might work. Uh, for some people it's shorter. Um, he realized very early on when he would take a tablet uh, it would knock his tremor out for two or three hours and then he would take another one and then another one and so he was trying to protect his movie career so every so often he would pop another one and that's uh, sort of what happened um, but I think for most of our patients we try to teach them uh, can you feel it kick in if so what does that feel like what does it do um, how long does that feeling last and when does it wear off and then uh, we try to dose it accordingly as I say, another popular question since we're talking about tremor, sorry Dr. Ayer, but this one is for you too, is that a lot of people think because you have tremor, does that necessarily mean you have Parkinson's disease? Can you talk about the two distinguishing diagnoses? Yeah, so there are a million things that'll cause tremors. Um, you know, when you're in front of a big audience and you're nervous, we all get a little shaky. That doesn't mean you have Parkinson's. We all have a little bit of a physiologic tremor. I know if I drink enough Starbucks, mine comes out. Um, but there are certain medications that people take that can cause tremors, you know, different stimulants. Um, certain antidepressants can cause tremors. Um, certainly Parkinson's is a, a tremorgenic condition. There's another condition that's very common that's called essential tremor that's often misdiagnosed as Parkinson's or Parkinson's is misdiagnosed as essential tremor. The differences tend to be that uh, Parkinson's is more often uh, one-sided or unilateral when it starts, whereas essential tremor affects both sides uh, from the outset. Um, Parkinson's tremors are typically when you're at rest, when your hand is resting in your lap or hanging down by your side. Essential tremor, like many of you might remember Catherine Hepburn had that famous voice, um, when you're doing things with your hands, that's when it shakes as opposed to when it's at rest. And so that's a big difference. So a lot of different things can cause tremors and not all of them are Parkinson's. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. The marker that everyone is so excited about in the scientific community that, that identifies people with Parkinson's prior to their um, tremors or other things showing up, why should those of us who So the question is, there is a Parkinson's marker that has been identified, and the question is, why should people already diagnosed with Parkinson's disease be excited about this marker? So I think you're referring to the, the recent uh, announcement from the Michael J. Fox Foundation that they've identified the, the alpha-synuclein protein in the spinal fluid. Um, and so again, I mean, it's, it's important to have a marker for disease because uh, ultimately when there is a treatment that will slow progression, stop it, maybe cure it, you want to identify people as early as possible. So people who are at high risk for developing it, maybe it's uh, someone who has a family history of it. Um, so, you know, if somebody has Parkinson's disease, you know, how exciting is it for you that um, they've identified this? I would say probably not terribly exciting, um, but ultimately what that translates into is that the earlier we can detect it and find it, once there is a treatment then um, that will slow the progression, then it would be made available to, to all of you. I think ultimately there will probably be a, da a database that will be created. People are going to give samples of their spinal fluid or even their skin now that there's the skin biopsy that's available. So uh, that's, that's what I would say about it. So let's go to feel. Let's talk about exercise. There are studies out here that shows that exercise actually slows the progression of Parkinson's disease. 
Phil, can you talk about your experience that you see with Parkinson's patients kind of when they first get there and the impact that exercise makes on them as they continue through your program? Definitely, I think, um, you know, the consistency, you know, your first time doing anything, it's gonna feel a little bit weird. You know, we're putting on gloves, um, we're punching something that's heavy, luckily it's not punching his back, but just getting better at, you know, understanding when to time the medicine, you know, understanding, you know, how the effect of the workout's gonna have, you know, make sure we're getting enough nutrition maybe beforehand or staying hydrated. Um, so I think consistency is, is really the biggest thing, but um, we always talk about move with purpose, move with intention and, um, you know, one of the most cool things to watch is, is Coach Dave, one of our coaches will say, hey, move with purpose, move with intention. Everybody's chest gets a little bit taller. And everybody starts to use those arms a little bit more and, and walk with that stride and um, move with that confidence. And it's, can we take that confidence that we have in our hour class and bottle it up and give it to you so we can live as much of the rest of our life with that confidence and walk with purpose and walk with intention and, hey, we're really reaching for that red line or, man, that left jab's getting a little bit stronger. And I think the consistency and just the, the daily progress that is able to be achieved by um, coming and doing the class. I mean, just like all of us, you know, um, as we work out, maybe we can run a mile a little bit faster or we can do one more push up. Um, it's the same thing here. And it's, like I said, just bottling up that, that intention, that purpose, that confidence, that strength, and trying to move out into as much of that 24 hour of the day as we can and not just in that hour of us together. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? I have a question. <laughs> yes. Dr. Iyer alluded to a skin biopsy test. Now, I was totally caught off by that when someone else mentioned it to me a few weeks ago. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I have apparently missed that somewhere. There's a, <clears throat> it was about a year ago that I guess the skin biopsy uh, gained uh, FDA approval. Um, I think CND Life Sciences is the name of the company and um, they've developed a punch biopsy uh, you take samples from three places, uh, one behind the neck, one just above the knee, and one just above the ankle. And uh, again, the, the thought is that this same protein, this alpha-synuclein that uh, we find in the brain, um, can also exist in the nerve fibers and the skin. And so by taking samples of it, uh, there's a lab in Phoenix, Arizona that does the analysis, um, but they can actually identify the, this protein. Uh, to confirm that you have one of three things, what we call synucleinopathies, um, people with alpha synuclein, meaning they would have either Parkinson's disease, um, Lewy body dementia, or, or multi-system atrophy, those three conditions in which that protein usually might exist. So, um, you know, relatively new, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty accurate, you know, um, sort of 96%, if I recall the data. Um, not terribly different, maybe a little bit better than DAT scans. Some of the data shows that you can identify the protein in the skin even uh, 10 years before the onset of symptoms. So again, as you speak to early diagnosis, ultimately when there is a definitive treatment, um, it's something that I think could be in the mix. So if someone maybe has early non-motor symptoms that you're experiencing all these other things that you could say, you know, that could be Parkinson's, that might be a good option it's possible I mean again I mean yeah. you have to look at the clinical picture um, I mean the doctors who develop the test will tell us that they have found this protein in people 10 years before the onset of their first motor symptoms so again a lot to be learned but but it is it is available The biopsy, excuse me, the biopsy has, has you know, reasonable insurance coverage. Um, even with insurance coverage, sometimes the copay or the out-of-pocket might be, I think, $1,000 or $1,200. Um, you know, we've done a ton of biopsies in our clinic, and, and we only do them when there's really good coverage and the patients don't have to pay a lot. The DAT scan, if there's no coverage, is, is I think, somewhere around $12,000. Um, again, you know, Medicare pays, you know, 80%. So 80% uh, of, you know, a lot is still a lot, um, you know, so uh, it just depends on the clinical situation as to which, you know, with the DAT scan, um, there's certain medications that if you're taking them, um, you have to come off them because it may interfere. I mean, the most common, uh, at least from my patient base, is um, an antidepressant, Wellbutrin. 
Um, so again, if someone's depression is well controlled and well butrid, I'm not gonna take them off it to get a DAT scan. I'd rather do the biopsy. But if someone's on a strong blood thinner and you don't wanna take them off that, you might wanna get the DAT scan. So good to have you know, multiple tests. Mm -hmm. What about diet? You said exercise can improve. Parkinson's, can diet do anything? And, and even supplements um, in addition to diet, is there something you can do that's not pharmaceutical maybe, but it's vitamins? So the question is what about diet and how does diet impact the treatment plan of Parkinson's as well as supplements? Dr. I am sorry, but that's you too. <laughs> so there's no diet that's been you know, scientifically proven to be better than any other um, for Parkinson's. I know in, in dementia, for example, they talk a lot about the Mediterranean diets and things like that. I mean, they looked at the, 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 the sort of the keto diets in Parkinson's um, and, and there's some, some data and some patients that suggest that maybe it's helpful, but you know, by and large, you know, what I tell patients is we all know that there are certain foods when you eat them, you feel energetic, you feel fueled, you feel good. There are certain foods when you eat them, you feel bad. You don't feel energetic, you feel lethargic. And so really follow that. You don't wanna eliminate any particular protein or, or carbohydrate group. You wanna make sure you're getting all your food groups. You know, uh, constipation can be a big problem in Parkinson's. So we think about all the green leafy vegetables and all the roughage and the hydration is very important. So. Again, there's no data-proven diet that, that's magical. It's really what works for your constitution. Yes, ma'am. I wonder uh, if you've had any new patients at the Memory and Movement Center come in with long COVID who are presenting with internal tremors and um, shaking and movement disorder and a problem with the sympathetic nervous system. I'm wondering if you found it's not Parkinson's per se, but have you had any experience, anybody coming in and using any of the Parkinson's treatments for those types of patients? So the question is, has anybody come in with long COVID, basically presenting with symptoms like Parkinson's and yeah. central nervous system? So I've not personally seen any patients, um, you know, come in with long COVID symptoms that, that were showing symptoms that you're describing. Um, we do, uh, I think, you know, when, when you talk to, you know, all the neurologists out there, um, many of us will, will hear, you know, internal tremors um, in our Parkinson's patients. Um, you know, whether you see it or not, a lot of people feel it on the inside and, and that can often be a sign that we see in patients with Parkinson's, but um, I can't specifically say that I've seen patients with long COVID that have come in with those symptoms. Sorry. Yes, sir. Going back to the um, exercise question and progression of the disease. So I understand that um, the recommendation is to have a, a cardio workout of 75 to 150 minutes a week that, that there's been documentation that slowed the progression of the disease. Just wondering if you are aware of that or can comment on it. Bill, you want to take that? Yeah, um, so much like the diet question, I mean, I, I wouldn't want someone to start day one and try and go seven days a week and, and trying to go all out and doing every yoga class or every Tai Chi class or every dance class. It's, it's really finding that that works best for you and then let's try and build from there. Um, so we have our, our rock steady boxing class three times a week. Um, and that's a big question that I get. Should I come one time? Should I come three times? Um, you know, I'd really encourage everybody to try and come as often as you're able and as often as you feel comfortable. And if you need to stop halfway through, hey, that's great. We're gonna try and get one more minute or 10 more minutes that next time. Um, and just like, I like, once again, how I would train a boxer for a fight or how I would train a runner for a race, it's really listening to that body on a daily basis. And number one, we don't wanna get injured in anything that we do. So, you know, making sure that the body's feeling good and feeling strong. But as you fill up to it, increasing the intensity. Um, and like I said, a lot of times that confidence kind of really comes about. Um, you know, one time a week is, is better than nothing at all. And, you know, I think there's a point of differentiating returns if we're trying to run 10 miles seven days a week. Um, and so, like I said, really finding what works best for you. Understanding that walking is one of the best forms of medicine that there is. You know, just going out for a five, 10 minute walk. Don't worry about how long you're walking for. Don't worry about what your heart rate is. 
you know, not stressing out, just being out in the environment, yoga, stretching, doing a five minute, 10 minute routine in the early morning time, getting that body feeling good. Um, it doesn't have to be down dog or anything like crazy like that. It could be done in a chair. Um, so just remembering that movement is energy and you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly into that 75 or 150. Um, it's, it's really building that routine that works best for you and trying to keep that as consistent as long as you can. But I would open up. I'm going to say, I think the summary is we all know that diet and exercise is going to impact us whether we have Parkinson's or not. So it's one of those that you do what you can um, for Parkinson's patients. Yes, they do adapt, but the main thing is to do what your body feels comfortable doing and not push beyond that until you work up to that, I think, is a good rule of thumb. I have had people ask me, well, you know, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, I loved cycling, I would ride my bike for 10 miles on the weekends, I guess I have to stop that. And I'm all, no, unless you're falling off, <laughs> you know, but don't, you don't have to stop exercise. That diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is not a, whoa, now I have to be careful, I, I need to slow down. It's a keep doing what you can do, like Phil's saying, you know, keep doing it until you can't, until it's not safe, until you're hurting yourself, talk to your doctor, but exercise as much as you can to the best of your ability. That's really what it's all about. And then taper it off from there if you have to. Um, but yeah, if, if you get that diagnosis and you're playing golf, keep playing, you're cycling, keep cycling. Like I said, as long as it's safe and you're not hurting yourself. Yeah, real quick, I mean, it doesn't have to be boxing. I love the, the news that Rock, Rock City Boxing's made and that they get, but, you know, if you're a cycle, cycle, yoga, yoga, walk is one of the best forms there is, you know, push-ups, sit-ups, whatever that is for you. Uh, you know, movement is energy and just trying to build up that strength and become stronger as we go. So it doesn't have to be a specific workout or a specific time. I just think the consistency is the key. Okay, guys. I think this has been great. I'd like to thank the Independent Picture House for sharing the film and hosting us tonight. Thank you. Also, thank you to my panelists, Phil, Emery, Dr. Iyer, and of course, Miss Betty Chapin. Sharing your story and your journey is very brave, and we appreciate that.